So now I'd like to introduce Raji Thomas. Raji is the founder and CEO of Sprinkler, a company using data and AI technologies to help many of the world's biggest companies like Nike, Dell, and L'Oreal understand and engage with their customers all across the internet, um, even in a Reddit thread, for example. So Raji is here to tell us all about the future of brands, customer engagement, and how to wrangle unstructured data at the edges of the internet. Um, as a quick reminder, you can submit your audience questions and I will try to get to them during the next 25 minutes. Raji, I'm so glad that you could join us for this fireside chat. Welcome to MTech Next. Hey, um, great to meet you, good to be here. Yeah, thank you. So um, obviously we're living in a time of very rapid change. Um, and one of those biggest changes is kind of how online our lives are becoming, you know, as people, as professionals, as consumers. And since you started Sprinkler in 2009, I know you've thought a lot about this. So how has customer acquisition and engagement and online conversation about companies evolved since you started Sprinkler? The biggest change is the proliferation of channels and the splintering of attention that is brought on, that has brought on to the consumer. It's no longer one channel, it's no longer go by TV in, in the five, 10 channels or the radio stations. Uh, as most of us can attest, we are constantly online. We are spending our time across a ton of social, digital, and other channels. And so finding customers and getting their attention is impossible. I think that's the first biggest change. The second big change is the fact that consumers are putting so much information about themselves in an unprecedented fashion. And so you can look anybody up on LinkedIn and understand where they've gone to school, every job they have had, you can look them up on Twitter. You can probably get a lot of their views on life, things that they follow. If they choose to make stuff uh, public on Instagram and, and, and Facebook, you get to know what the social life is like. Um, so there's a certain expectation that comes with making the data available and how do you use the data? How do you access the data or not is sort of another big change. And the third is the fact that consumers are connected to each other. So it's almost like anything you say is going to be ignored unless it's validated by what others are saying and validated by uh, the concentric network of people that are increasingly closer to that consumer. So I think the front office, all customer facing functions that a brand has, is, has to transform to adapt to this new reality. Yeah, I mean, and that seems like quite a big task for brands and quite a big adjustment to how brands are used to engaging with their customers. So what are brands struggling with right now, especially the really big brands that have, you know, tens of thousands of customers talking about them online at any moment of time? So let's break it down. And it's a large, complex, I think a multi-decade transformation. So I don't want to just, just give you an answer for how with it. The way I think about it is digital 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 for the brand in the front office. Let's just stick to customer facing functions since um, that's sort of where I, uh, my, my background is. In digital 1.0, we've done a, we did a fabulous job of reaching customers the way we have done that offline. So we've done postal mail. And so we figured out how to do email well. We did uh, banners and, you know, uh, billboards, so we figured out how to do banner ads well. Um, we figured out e-commerce, so there's a, there's a, we figured out how to just put information out, uh, you know, from a brand out. And so we, we had precedents and we figured out how to do 1.0 really well. 2.0 is really about listening and understanding what customers are saying. So if you, um, if you have your social listening, you have your uh, AI setup, hopefully now, by now, 
to get product insights, brand insights, location insights, competitive insights from that data, you're kind of adapting to that 2.0 of the change in digital that can digital can bring about for you. And for me, 3.0, it's really about conversations and engaging. So you've reached, if you listen, and how do you now engage? And the closest model that I explain this to um, using is the analogy of someone walking into the store. So if, if I walk into the, the Verizon store or the Apple store and go, oh my God, my phone's really slow, you know, they'll probably direct me to someone in the back, a tech person who look at it and he could potentially go, you know what, I can remove some apps. They'll take me an hour. I'm going to charge you a hundred bucks. But I think you should just probably just buy the iPhone 14, the Pixel 7 <laughs> or whatever it is. And he'll turn around and say, hey, um, Matt, can you, are there any deals going? And what you're seeing there is a service interaction that just through conversations translated to sales and branding and marketing and loyalty um, and the context of the customer being seamlessly passed along and the external context of the customer made available to that shared team that's working on that conversation. Um, in digital 3.0, it's about doing that at scale. And you'd imagine with AI and technology, especially with conversation AI, you should be able to do that at will millions of times, right? And, 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 and just really, whatever your brand is, I'm not saying what you should say, how you should say, whatever your brand is, how do you work across business units, markets, customer facing functions and channels to create that seamless personalized conversational experience that spans everything from service to marketing and sales. Yeah, so in this kind of time frame of digital 3.0, as you call it, how is AI helping companies understand how to engage with their customers? How are How is Sprinkler using AI to help really big companies figure out how to talk to their customers? Yeah. So um, AI is not a new concept. I'm fascinated by the, the sudden rush of enthusiasm. And, and you know, if, you, if you go back and look at the prospect is from, you know, when we went public in 21, we had seven pages of why, you know, we are an AI company. And, and the reason that was not obvious for a lot of people was because a lot of that AI was working in the back end. And, and just made your life better, but which is not in your face. What's happening right now with generative AI is we are able to bring to in a way that looks and feels a lot more important to you. And ChatGPT is just a, a large language model that has been trained on a crazy amount of data. So you can see the application of that live. So, uh, our, we have thousands of features. We have thousands of models that have been trained in over 100 languages forever. And it's not about Sprinkler or our AI. The key here is with generative AI, we're able to make the agent feel a lot more, make the agent's life a lot more easier or the consumer's life a lot more easy. Let me use two specific examples. So we have one of our four product suites. It's a contact CCAS product suite. Um, that we're ripping and replacing contacts and the stacks with as they move to the cloud. Um, and it's, it's completely AI powered. So when the call comes or the message comes, uh, we're understanding it, getting intent, routing it, identifying, using chatbots, talking to the consumer, and then using smart assignment and smart pairing, we're finding the agent who can best solve that. And then we have this feature called smart response that would go through the previous thousands of cases like that and suggest the solution to the agent so he doesn't have to go through the knowledge base and do everything. With generative AI, now we're able to take that prompt and convert it into a fairly human-like script that the agent can just read. So the, we saw the adoption of that feature go up 300%. Same thing in marketing messages as we're able to create ad copies now 
uh, or in chatbot make those conversations feel very human, we're seeing the adoption take a quantum leap. So that's that's the key difference. Um, and I think that everybody is jumping in the fray and saying AI all day. But I think what's going to separate companies who are going to win big with AI, because let's just assume everyone's going to use AI. We should. Um, from the ones that don't are the ones who don't are thinking of AI as a feature or as a SKU or something that is an add-on. Whereas companies like a Google or a Facebook or even a Sprinkler, we're thinking of AI as the core technology for everything we do. And we have been for five years now. Mm. So there are some limits to AI technology, right? And and one of them, especially when it comes to interfacing with customers, is we've all had that experience where we're talking to a chatbot or we're on the phone with an automated system and the system cannot understand how frustrated we're becoming. They don't understand, you know, the gravity of the scenario, the urgency, you know, whatever it is. And that can be really, really frustrating and off-putting to customers. So one thing that you've been working on, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but is sentiment analysis. So understanding what customers are saying and how they're feeling, getting a little bit of insight into their emotion. Um, and obviously this is something that AI has been trying to do for a while. There are some obstacles to it. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're trying to do sentiment analysis and, and use technology to do that? Yeah, so the way that it works is, you know, we cut our teeth in unstructured digital conversations, the one that you would have on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And what we did when we got into the contact center, the voice side of the business was we started transcribing um, the voice to text in real time and applying the same analysis. So uh, the Sprinkler platform, the AI component that analyzes has got nine layers. And so reads everything from what is a conversation, breaks it down to phrases, understands the context, understands the product that's mentioned, understands the language, puts that together semantically and connects it back, looks up the database. That's sort of how it works. And we can, you know, if you're reading text, you can read images and understand videos and stuff. Um, what we're also able to do from the ton tonality of the voice is understand both from the words and the tonality is the customer getting frustrated. And so, for example, in the contact center, we're, all, 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 we're able to kind of patch a supervisor in without someone saying, I am, I want to talk to a supervisor. We, we can prevent that escalation or coach the agent to back off if we're sending frustration. And the good news is a lot of this can be done behind the scenes, right? So we know uh, the network for the lifetime value of the customer, the products that are involved, we're looking up knowledge bases. So AI can really, really, really transform in your contact center, your sales process. Um, but I don't think of AI competing with humans. A lot of people that it's, oh, I got an AI company or got, it's not how I think about it. I think AI can complement and help scale humans. So literally, if you're using the sprinkler uh, chat capability, which is omnichannel, you can, you know, talk type, whatever, um, the, the bot knows that things has got very high confidence and it can keep going. Now with generative AI, look, really give you a near human experience. So much so that the last demo we gave the CEO swore we were cheating. <laughs> There's not someone behind the scenes answering this, but it can get very good. But the frustration that you articulate to take comes when that bot hits a dead end and mm -hmm. forces the consumer to go to the call center, regular call center, and repeat the entire thing. And that's because the traditional call center technology companies, many of which are 30, 40 years old, they, they just truly don't have an omni-channel solution. They're not context aware. They can maintain state from, they can't even maintain state from session to session. So the way to understand that is if you go to a chat support situation, start, close the chat, you come back, <clears throat> preserving state across sessions within the channel should be easy, but most people don't do it. But what you really need and what we do is, is really able to preserve that context and state across channels. 
So you should be able to call in because you're on the way to the airport. But as you go in and go to the lounge, you may want to start texting or pick up that context. So there's some underlying architectural things that have not been implemented in the contact center or most customer facing functions because in the front office, everything is super fragmented and siloed. So the email team sits and operates very differently from the voice team, sits and operates operates very differently from the Twitter and the Facebook team. And that's what we need to start reimagining. And that's what we try to do with what we call as unified customer experience management. Yeah, so can you give me some good examples of clients of yours that you work with that are kind of taking on the omni-channel moment and um, meeting their customers where they're at? Some examples that you know perhaps show the value of this new technology that you're using? Yeah, let me give you a few examples of how to bring this to life. Uh, one is, the uh, let's, let me give you an example of using the voice of the customer to drive your product innovation or even to fix, decide and prioritize what to fix first. So uh, one of the largest tech companies in the world, um, you're probably thinking of two, one of them, um, who has got a very, very popular um, you know, voice assistant capability rolled into every one of the devices. When, back when the Black Lives Movement started, um, if you asked this assistant, do Black Lives Matter? Um, and it would say, yes. And if you turned around and asked, do white lives matter? At that point in time, super early, it was in training. So it said, I don't know. And that was becoming a meme hurting the brand. It was picked up by our listening capability using the volumetrics trigger because a negative, cynical uh, emotion, sentiment, volumetrically scaling and routed to the team that fixed it in 19 minutes. And so this is an example of crisis detection and product prioritization. And as a result for many of these companies, we are now able to set up closed loop feedback systems. And most of these companies, best companies in the world, they got tremendous instrumentation. But you know, every company has a list of thousands of things to fix. Which one is the most impactful for the customer? Use the voice of the customer to do that. So that's one example. Um, another one is that I love talking about is L'Oreal, um, and has made the CDO now, and Lubo Mira, the CDO before. Uh, that they came out with the strategy of wanting to engage anybody who wants to talk to the brand um, and be the first company in the world to do that, it, it, like regardless of what the scale and volume is. And it was a hoot for us to partner with them and give them the technology to do that. And imagine, you know, how what L'Oreal does and how they they have to transform themselves because the traditional model is, you know, I'm at Macy, someone's walking in, I, I'm letting you put some you know, try something on and then deciding what to buy. What's a digital equivalent of getting those beauty consultants on a video call or connecting online and, and kind of moving it to the next 10, 15 years? Um, that's another great example. So many stories of using, the, I mean, not to mention uh, somebody like a Samsung who is now able to not look at contact center as a, as a cost center, right? But as an engagement center and bring the sales um, aspect to it and the marketing aspect to it. So the consumer has a very seamless conversational experience and they're able to not think of call center as, you know, how do I quickly solve an issue when somebody calls? So how do I prevent those calls in the first place? And how do I, when they a customer has an issue, how do I help them not have to call the contact center? And then when they do, how do I help them get resolved in the first try. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and thanks for the insightful examples. Um, I have a great audience question here that's kind of related to the first case study um, that you gave us from um, Evangia. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Um, what would be your strategy for minimizing the, the risks of generative AI, especially when vulnerable companies, um, excuse me, vulnerable customers try to use this technology? More generally, what safeguards are you putting around your use of generative AI? 
Yeah, great question. I'm glad um, the, the question was raised. Look, it's we're all excited about ChatGPT, and we should be. It shows you the power of generative AI. But I'll tell you, if you go to any of the popular Bing, Bard, whatever you want to call it, and or, or even ChatGPT and try it out, sometimes you get like a really crazy answer today. And that's okay because you smile at often, but that was cute. Um, I recently uh, was using one of those and I, I asked the uh, AI to summarize my last 8K uh, and, and um, what all my SEC filings. So what came out was Sprinkler got acquired. I'm like, it would be great for me to know because that was not true. Um, so it, you can find something truly bizarre and unusual, which as a consumer on a search experimental basis, that's okay. But for someone like us, for the brands we work with, as you know, we work with all 10 of the 10 biggest brands, right? 80 of the top 100. And, you know, we have countries that are run on Sprinkler now. We can't afford to have unpredictable, unpredictable responses. We just can't. You can't be off brand. You can't have something that the brand can't stand behind. So the key there is to get to move from unpredictable to predictable responses. You have to go from training these models on, uh, you have to go from training them on unbound data, where you don't know what it's training on, to bound data. So that's the key. The, this is where the early excitement will fade, because if you're just using an API to call an open AI, you know, uh, API and just put the response up, it's cute. But what we need in the enterprise is models that are trained on your data, on bound data, that generate predictable responses 100% of the time that are on brand. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And um, my next question is a, a kind of follow-up to that. So, you know, you're speaking with some of the biggest CEOs of the biggest companies who are excited about deploying large language models to talk to their company, to their customers. Um, what are the biggest mistakes you are seeing people meet, make right now? Um, I, I think everyone's excited as it always ap uh, happens. You, you try to jump in head first and without a strategy, without stepping back and, and really having a phased approach. This is not, you turn something on and AI is going to transform your company situation. This is really, uh, AI has been around for a very long time. Uh, neural network algorithms with transformers being around for five years, you're just seeing a very glamorous um, application of something that's evolving. And in, you need to kind of think about developing the skills, understanding where you can apply it, understanding your training data set, understanding the investment you need to make, understanding the ethical responsibilities that come with it, and then put a phase one, phase two, and phase three plan to do it, because it's more complicated than you think to get it right and get it right consistently. Yeah, I think that's um, very prudent advice. So, and probably our um, final question for the time that we have allocated today, where do you think this is going? Is there a, a digital 4.0 on the horizon that you are thinking uh, thinking ahead about? Look, it's always fun to think about what happens in 10 years, and I'm sure there'll be new things. I think we have unpaid debt in dealing with digital 2.0. Um, and, and, and there are very few companies in the world that are really digital 3.0 ready at this point. I'd say we're still catching up to digital 2.0. How many of your senior executives in the audience or otherwise can say, look, we're using the voice of the customer to drive our business. At best, you're doing surveys. And I got nothing against surveys. Um, but that's solicited and structured, and it's not always real time. So I challenge you to step back and say, hey, how do I use the voice of the customer everywhere all the time to drive my business and understand what's going around us? Because my analogy is if you're not doing that, you're like driving on the highway with your, all your windows shut and with no rear view mirror 
and you're driving with your eyes and, and uh, eyes shut, which is crazy. But you got to be aware of what's going on with the data that is publicly available. You got to do it responsibly and with privacy first. Um, that's 2.0. And then how do you kind of emulate whatever your brand is and, and do that in digital in a conversational way across your front office? How do you take your contact centers instead of thinking about firing people, how do you convert them into a digital concierge that is scaled using AI and create this front door for your company that's always open that people can come just talk to you about? And, and those are things that people will take another three to five years to nail correctly. Yeah, we have a little bit more time for you to expand on that. What exactly are you talking about when you say, you know, we need the data tech stack um, in order to be able to have this omni-channel um, front door when we talk to our, our consumers? Can you be a little specific about, you know, what sort of data technologies um, CIOs and CTOs we might have in the audience should be looking at? Well, <laughs> talk to Sprinkler, sorry. That was just a shameless plug there, but that... Let me give you a specific example. So we work with the uh, the country, the government of Qatar, um, that has 40 different customer-facing departments of ministries that, you know, does everything that, you know, engages with the citizen. And, and what they wanted to do is digitize everything and unify everything. So if you want, I'm using an example here. Um, if, you, if I move into a, a government building and I want to apply for a building permit and I want to show my income proof and, you know, get the, uh, an apartment for rent and then go to the electrical um, department, electricity department and apply for. All of that can be streamlined. And so today we have an app anywhere where you start it's called Shattuck. The product project is called Shattuck, but the government wants you to just talk to it. And then wherever it is, we'll route to the right department, get the teams involved, keep them guided workflow, swing them from one to the other. So step seven involves you bringing your passport and showing it. The queuing system is connected to Sprinkler. So you show up, um, the person on the other side, up, verify it, and you go to step eight and you can leave. And instead of the, uh, the previous state where you come in and say, oh, you haven't done one, two, or three, and it's all verified, and you can go across departments. And that's fantastic. That's how we're designed to work. Um, yeah. And every city government can, can, can sort of visualize citizen experience in that way, It'll change the world. Thank you so much. That's, that's so interesting. And this was such a great conversation. Thanks so much uh, for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Jake.